October, we have the freeze. Here's a look at the week of September 14th, which will go down in history as I think the, uh, the tipping point. By Thursday, Ben Bernanke is in front of Congress saying, if we don't do this, we may not have an economy on Monday. You know, Fannie and Freddie are all already in conservatorship. Just absolutely amazing. The Dow, uh, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I did not open my 401k last week when I got it. It's like, forget it. Um, but here's, here's one of the issues, you know, the issue now is not liquidity. The issue is getting banks in a position where they are willing to make loans in this economy. And um, when that $700 billion uh, recovery plan was passed, the idea was they were going to use most of that money to sop up the bad assets being held by financial institutions to free them to make more loans. And it became clear pretty quickly that that was really going to be tough to do. Uh, equity issues were, were obviously um, one of the problems. Is it really fair that the guy that's holding in there and paying his mortgage not get a bailout while the neighbor that was completely irresponsible that you know there was all that kind of stuff and it's really one mortgage at a time and they quickly transition to we are going to use 250 billion dollars to buy equity stakes in the nine largest banks in the united states and a lot of the smaller ones as well and here's the issue here's a look at fixed rate the fixed rate the 10-year bond and the difference between the two. And what is the difference between the two? Well, the 10-year bond really has no risk. I mean, the government is going to pay on that. Fixed, year, fixed, uh, fixed rate mortgage, that's a mortgage-backed security, and that has a risk associated with home, buyer, home buyers prepaying or going into default on their mortgage. And you can see quite clearly, as you look at, and we start going into 2007, the summer of 2007 through 2008, the risk premium demanded by investors to be willing to hold securities that are related to or made up of mortgage-backed securities increased dramatically, right? And that's what affected us in terms of, of this credit crunch. And then we got into a situation where it just wasn't mortgages anymore, it was commercial paper. Right? It was banks not even being willing to lend to General Motors or GE and not even being willing to loan to themselves. So this is, again, I don't want to take up all of my time on, on this, but this is kind of the reality. And I, I think I used this last time, but this is the before and after. It's George Bailey is a portfolio lender. And one of the reasons underwriting so high right now is you have a lot of these loans being made by newly transformed portfolio lenders. They can't pass that risk on to somebody else. If somebody else is gone, they're gonna to have to hold it in portfolio and they wanna make sure there's enough cushion so they don't get burned. My favorite part of this movie is when there's a run on the bank, right? And George is sitting there and he's trying to give people their money and he kind of looks at the head count and he realizes that there isn't enough money in the bank to pay everybody off. And he gives the explanation to Mr. Smith, you know what, you know where your money is, it's not here, it's in Mrs. Jones's house, you know, when he goes through that, and it just is, sends chills down my spine, but it's, that's the way the world used to be. And the world we're in now is, I think, defined by the title of this book, which actually came from another comment by Chairman Greenspan when he was doing testimony uh, on Capitol Hill, but it really has become, a, and again, you know, um, if you're interested in this stuff, I, I do recommend this book. This guy has been one of the experts they've been using on 60 Minutes, but he was a trader, he's an attorney, he teaches uh, at the University of, of San Diego now, but in just very plain terms, he starts in about 1990 and goes through 2002 and really talks about what these derivatives were and why they were unregulated and why they actually should have been regulated. And it really, you know, it's very complicated, but it isn't. It really gets down to one issue, in my opinion, and that is transparency. You know, and if you don't know what you're buying, 
You don't know what you have, you can't value it. And that's one of the biggest reasons the market seized up. You know, I'm looking at some of these assets for houses, and I'm thinking, if that house burnt down, the land is worth more than what, <laughs> than what it's going for right now. Same with the stock market. But it doesn't matter when people don't have trust and confidence in the financial markets. If you don't have that, you don't have anything. We spent a lot of time looking at the books of Fannie and Freddie. They did get into the subprime thing a little bit the last couple of years, but in general, their portfolio was so much stronger than a lot of the investment banks on Wall Street. Absolutely. But you know what? It didn't matter. It didn't matter when faith and trust um, disappeared. So I, I've gotten a lot of calls. Some of them have been a little bit on edge asking whose fault is this. And, you know, I think you can look at a whole series of things that I've given kind of my, my list here. But I really do think we need to get back to personal financial accountability. Um, and really, um, one of the surveys I'm going to show you in a minute, a first-time buyer says that like 22% of them did not understand the terms of their loan. Um, people come up and say, well, you know, they were lied to. You know, I think we should just all really kind of step back and make sure that, you know, that that can't, can't happen. On the other hand, uh, as we look at rewriting the rules of real estate finance, my, I'm telling you, we are going to get more transparency than you can imagine, you know, with, with uh, uh, good faith estimates and all that, all that kind of stuff. So people really do, um, really do understand. Um, inaccurate pricing of risk, that was a huge, huge problem, obviously. And then I mentioned earlier in my remarks the trade and, and budget deficits, and I think it is also important to understand that component of what's going on. There is just a huge pool of capital out there looking for high returns. And all of a sudden, they don't have to buy a T-bill that's going nowhere. They can get into some fancy derivative mortgage-backed securities or credit default swap and earn three, four, five percent. And when you look at the history of mortgage prepayment, it looks like the risk is very low. And it wasn't. Let me kind of conclude this, this uh, with just a look at um, the other bright part of my remarks, which is the state of the overall economy. <laughs> um, second quarter growth was pretty good. It was directly tied to the tax rebate checks. This is why we are going to see, regardless of who is elected, a stimulus package in the first part of 2009. Absolutely. This economy is teetering on the edge. There's a lot of debate about whether we're in a recession or not. I, I was listening to Bernanke uh, testifying in front of the House Budget Committee as I was driving to work last week, and one of the Congress uh, congressmen was really adamant about getting him to say we are in a recession, and I really felt bad for him because he couldn't say it because it's a technical definition. You know, it's two consecutive quarters of GDP shrinking. Forget about it. We are in a recession. You know, where if, however you want to define it, in my view, wherever we are right now, we want to be in a much greater position. So definitely we're going to see a stimulus package. The biggest problem we are facing, and I think we are going to go through a structural adjustment where consumer spending is not going to be able to hold up the economy as it has in the past. In the last 20 years, the percent of economic activity tied to the